May the peace and blessings of the Almighty be upon you all, my beloved brothers and sisters in humanity and in faith as well. Muslims generally have two major occasions of happiness and joy, the days known as the days of Eid. They always come after dedicated worship, after a huge sacrifice, after having done something major for the Almighty. For example, the first Eid, known as Eid al-Fitr, is at the end of the ninth month of the lunar calendar that the Muslims actually follow. And that is the month of Ramadan, wherein which we fast. We stay away from things that are otherwise permissible. Normal water and normal general food that we would eat on any day and even relations with our spouses. So we stay away from that during the daylight hours only. For an entire month, the idea is to achieve closeness to the Almighty, to discipline yourself. Islam is all about discipline. You need to be able to uh, uh, obey instructions and listen to that which is beneficial to you. So after dedicating your month to acts of worship and uh, benefiting yourself as well through uh, perhaps improving your health through the fasting, disciplining yourself for the Almighty, and enjoying the beautiful month of Ramadan, the Almighty gives us a day known as the day of Eid al-Fitr, depicting the end of the fasting season. And that is a beautiful day, deserved, well deserved, after a month of goodness. Now, in a similar way, in the last month of the lunar calendar, which is known as the month of Dhul Hijjah, that's the 12th month of the lunar calendar, in that month, from the beginning of the month, right up to the ninth, the tenth days, we are trained to actually engage in extra acts of worship. The Prophet Muhammad, may peace be upon him, has said that there are no days wherein which the Almighty loves acts of worship more than the first ten days of Dhul Hijjah, which is the twelfth month of the lunar calendar. Now, Ramadan, we know, was all about fasting. What about the Hajj? The Hajj is all about the Prophet Abraham and his sacrifice. So he sacrificed his son. According to the Muslim scriptures, that son was Ismail. According to the Jewish and the Christian scriptures, that son was Ishaq or Isaac. May peace be upon them all. Nonetheless, this son who was sacrificed, what was the reason behind that sacrifice? The Prophet Abraham, may peace be upon him, was very close to the Almighty. He was the father of all the prophets who came after him, according to Islamic belief. And he was revered, he was respected, he was Khalilullah, meaning a friend of the Almighty. And he had built what we know as the Kaaba in Mecca, a house of worship, wherein which people would gather and worship the Almighty alone, their maker, and no one else. So... When that happened, at a certain point, he saw a dream. And in that dream, he was instructed by the Almighty to sacrifice his son. Perhaps, according to Muslim scriptures, in order to serve as a lesson for all of us, that the Almighty actually should come before everything and anything else. Obedience to the Almighty is always first. So, when you get too attached to something, it becomes unhealthy. If you're too attached to your son or your daughter or your spouse or anything material, there is a point beyond which it becomes unhealthy because if you were to lose them to the Almighty's destiny through death or something bad were to happen, you would not be able to survive the loss. So we're not allowed to harm anyone. Obviously, that instruction was something divine for a purpose and even the fulfillment of it was not exactly as it was instructed, but I'll explain in a moment how it happened. Going back to the lesson that we learn from it, when you get too attached to something material, for example, say your car or your phone or something in your house, your clothing, the day the clothing is burnt with the iron, the day the car is damaged, the day your product is broken, you may become so angry and vexed that you might lose control, you might harm people, you might do something silly, you might harm yourself, depending on what exactly you've lost. So the Almighty is telling us, listen, I come before everything else. Destiny is chosen by me. 
prescribed by me. Yes, you have a role to play and I've given you a choice. And the only thing you're going to be questioned about on the day of judgment is how you utilize the choice that I actually gave you. If I did not give you a choice uh, about something, I'll never ask you about it because it's not fair. So the prophet Abraham was instructed to sacrifice his son. He told his son, according to the Quranic scripture, obviously I'm speaking about the Muslim narrative. He told his son, oh my son, I've been instructed through a dream to actually sacrifice you. What do I do? His son says, well, do as you're told. Because the Almighty will never let us down. And so he then was uh, known, it's known that he took his son and he was about to enact what the Almighty had instructed him when the Almighty replaced that son with a ram from heaven, right? And that depicted the ultimate submission to the Almighty, <clears throat> which means you've understood that everything comes from the Almighty, everything belongs to the Almighty. Don't get so attached. Obviously, we're all naturally attached, but there is a level beyond which it becomes toxic and it even becomes dangerous for us. So the Almighty is the owner. He gave it to you in the first place and he's going to take it back at some point. Now, that sacrifice, when it was replaced with a ram, the Almighty loved it so much that he asked us all to reenact that more for the lesson than anything else. So the Almighty says, look, the meat or the blood is not going to get to the Almighty. According to the Quranic script in the Arabic language, it is the piety and the God consciousness that is of essence, not uh, the meat and the blood, etc., of the ram or the sacrificial animal. So, in the first 10 days of Dhul Hijjah, the Prophet, peace be upon him, Muhammad, peace be upon him, said, There are no days wherein which Acts of worship are more loved by the Almighty than the first 10 days of Dhul Hijjah. When it came to Ramadan, the nights were more sacred, indeed. And we were taught that the nights of Ramadan are so loved by Allah when you worship the Almighty in those days, or in those nights, sorry. And during the day, you're actually fasting. So when it comes to Dhul Hijjah, it's the day that's of essence. And the night, yes, you spend in the worship of the Almighty as well. Muslims pray five times a day. Two of those prayers are at night. One of them is just after sunset. One is slightly later and one is before the sun rises. So actually three of them are after sunset. Two of them are at night and two of them are during the day. That makes five. Those are short prayers that don't last more than a few minutes. But it's just to be able to turn to the Almighty. Remind yourself, I came from there. I'm going to go back there. The one who made me is going to have mercy on me. And he is the only one I worship. And I call him Allah, which means the worshipped one. Eloha or Elohim in the Hebrew language. Now, the prophet Abraham and his sacrifice, his life is celebrated by the Muslims in a great way. His son Ismail, his son Isaac or Ishaq, may peace be upon them all, his wives. And everything that he did, the dedication, is studied by the Muslims, just like it's studied by others. But we reenact this. We worship the Almighty for these nine whole days. And on the tenth day, we're given an Eid, known as Eid al-Adha. Eid al-Adha actually lasts for three days. So that Eid... We're, we're in which we're meant to reach out to the poor again with meat, with food stuff, with something to eat, with something to celebrate with. We're meant to be reaching out to the poor. And that's why the Almighty says, divide your sacrifice into three. A third you can eat from. A third give your family and friends. And a third dedicate it to the poor. That's an amazing Islamic teaching. Even your wealth, it would be brilliant if you could divide it into three. It's not compulsory regarding your general wealth, because there is a bare minimum that you have to give, known as the charity, the zakat. So charity in the English language has the understanding that it's totally voluntary. Whereas when it comes to the zakat that the Muslims give, it's not voluntary, but it's a type of charity that's actually compulsory. You must give 2.5%. So when it comes to the sacrificial animal, we give and we reach out to the poor. The idea is to be able to become a better person. With all of these teachings, the idea is to improve on two things. Every time Islam has taught us something, the idea is to improve on two things. One is 
your relationship with the one who made you, and two is your relationship with everything else that he has made. As simple as that. Now, you have people from different understandings at times, a minority who misinterpret things and they they are cruel towards those who perhaps belong to other faiths, maybe other races, maybe other nationalities. This is not only within the Muslims, but a lot of people have this misunderstanding. We are actually brothers and sisters because we come from Adam and Eve. And even though we may not share the same faith, notice at the beginning I said my beloved brothers and sisters, in humanity at least, and even in faith. Uh, some of you might be my brothers and sisters in faith too, but if you're not, no big deal. You're still my brothers and sisters in humanity. The minimum I afford you is the respect of a human being, of an extended family of mine, even if I disagree with you. And that's something that we're taught as Muslims. And this is where when the sacrifice comes in, we as Muslims, we do have a little bit of difference of opinion regarding certain details. You know, how old should the animal be? Uh, exactly what time should it happen? And so on. Is there a leeway? Is there no leeway? Uh, but that does not remove us from being connected in the same way when you don't belong to my faith. It doesn't remove us from being connected through humanity. And we should discuss our faiths. I mean, today I'm speaking to you. Tomorrow you can speak to me. Tell me what you believe, what you think. We should be free to do this in a very respectful way. No attacking people, no abusing them, no swearing them. Just present your opinion. You may want to express why you feel someone else is wrong, but in a beautiful way. Just to get them to understand and then to make their minds up as to what exactly they want to do. Now, this is something that is lacking in today's world. Or should I say, it needs to be encouraged more. And I pray that this uh, beautiful occasion of the Eid al-Adha, the Eid of the sacrifice, is actually going to be uh, a time of reflection, a time of sacrifice, dedication, a time of worship, a time of reaching out to the poor, and a time of building the bond with both the uh, departments that we're supposed to be building the bonds with. Number one, my relationship with my maker. Number two, my relationship with the rest of the creatures of the same maker. Thank you so much for giving me this opportunity. I pray that we've benefited. Jazakumullah khair. May the Almighty recompense you with beautiful goodness. Ameen. Assalamu alaikum. May peace be upon you.